Welcome to today's episode of Asian American Focus. Today, as our special guest, we have intellectual property attorney Jerry Liu, who I have actually known since I was a kid. We went to Chinese school together. But today he's going to talk to us about how he went from being a Georgia Tech grad in engineering and then went on to Emory Law School and how his career progressed as a patent or intellectual property attorney. Jerry Liu graduated from Georgia Tech with a bachelor's degree and then a master's degree in electrical engineering. Then he went to Emory University School of Law on a full scholarship graduating in 1999. He worked as an attorney for various large law firms and was also in-house counsel for companies such as AT&T before becoming law partner at his current firm in Atlanta. He's also taught as an adjunct professor for over 17 years at Georgia Tech in the school of parents policy. are originally from China, but they grew up in Taiwan and came over to the United States many years ago to attend college. Jerry was born in Atlanta and raised in Atlanta. Take it, right? Yeah, yeah, the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Um, for you to be able to obtain and, and basically represent uh, clients before the United States Patent Office, you have to take their own their bar exam, the United States Patent Bar. Um, and before you could do that, you have to meet certain uh, math, science, electives, and classes. And if you graduate from ABET Accredited Engineering School, which George Tech was, you automatically qualify to sit for that exam. Um, and there are two types of representatives that 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 are before the Patent and Trademark Office. Um, there's the patent agent and then there's the patent attorney. Now, as a patent agent, you can also draft patents and represent your clients before the patent office. And a lot of law firms actually hire patent agents to basically draft their patent applications. Um, you know, the difference between a patent agent and a patent attorney, of course, is just that the patent attorney also has a law degree and they can, uh, you know, represent the client in other uh, matters that are not necessarily related to the patent office, for example. Uh, we can give legal opinions. We can work on litigation cases. Uh, you know, we can, we can engage in practicing law, whereas a patent agent uh, would not be able to do those things. But, but a lot of patent agents and patent attorneys, they, they, they do similar things, which is basically draft patents and respond to patent office rejections and, uh, and basically do their best to procure those, um, uh, procure the patents and issuance of patent before the patent trademark office for the clients. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So when did you take the patent bar and how, how did you prepare for it? So um, my, first, uh, my first job was at a, um, a local law firm, Jones and & Askew, um, and I'm very thankful for them. Tony Askew started that firm and it had been around since the 1960s. Um, and that, that firm basically was going through um, a transitional period because back in the late uh, late 90s and early 2000s, you had this dot-com boom where basically there were a lot of startup companies mm -hmm. that were all internet companies and, and web companies. Um, and back then you had a lot of venture company, venture capital money just funding all these startups. And a lot of these startups would, uh, you know, grab attorney, grab a, you know, a CFO and, and try to find like a MBA, um, you know, background person to, to be the CEO. Um, and then also maybe somebody who, who does marketing there were all these startups out there and they were starting to grab attorneys left and right. And, you know, I think patent law itself was just sort of in a big boom at that time. Um, so a lot of patent attorneys wound up going in house. A lot of attorneys in general wound up going in house for these startup companies. So uh, the bigger firms were responding by hiring more attorneys and compensating them more. Um, and being that patents were very important to uh, technology and web technology, they started to sort of, uh, I'd say pilch, or maybe steal or, or recruit away um, patent attorneys from from what used to be just boutique law firms. And when I say boutique law firm, I'm talking about a law firm that had a bunch of attorneys that only did intellectual property. So, so my firm was about, uh, I guess, 40 attorneys. Um, um, and they basically were all engineering or math science people, whether it's biology or mechanical or chemical or electrical engineering. Uh, they were all patent attorneys. Um, and everybody in the firm did either patents, trademarks, or copyrights. Um, but what happened during the dot-com era was just that all these big firms started to hire uh, people away from, from these firms. So we, we, we lost a lot of partners. A lot of partners went to different law firms throughout the whole city, whether it's 
you know, Morris Manny Martin or King of Spalding or Troutman or, or, um, yeah. Yeah. I, was, I was asking you, when did you actually take the bar exam? Was it like your second year of law school? Or yeah. Yeah. Sorry. It's a long story, but basically that's, you know, in my first year, basically my law firm went out of business. You know, the attorneys joined one of these, dot, one of these, you know, bigger firms. So, so basically, you know, I left that firm and I had a whole month off between that job and my next job. Um, so during that month, that's when I, that's when I prepared for the patent bar. Um, when I took it, I think the pass rate was 37%. Yeah. I've heard it's, it's really low, like a third of yeah. people pass it. And I, I don't necessarily know if it's because it's particularly difficult. I like to say it's particularly difficult because it makes me sound more intelligent, but at the same time, I think a lot of people who take that exam, uh, uh, whether they're engineers, or lawyers, they're, they're kind of working day jobs, you know? So it's really, really hard to be working during the day and yeah. studying at night. But I was just fortunate because I had a whole like month off to study and prepare for this exam. Oh, so you were already working when you took the bar exam? Because I thought yeah, that- I finished my first year of I finished my first year of practice, and that's when I took the patent bar. Oh, okay. And then was there a class that you could take? Because I thought there was some sort of like class yes, was- yes. There there are several classes out there. Um, you know, I think, uh, one is offered by the patent law Institute PLI and the other ones, um, it was offered by the patent resources group. Um, I don't know if that's the same name of the, the those companies, uh, the patent resource group right now. I think they got absorbed into land and IP. Uh, but those were two of the more popular, popular classes. It's almost like, uh, if you remember from law school, one would be Barbary and one would be West. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's kind of the equivalent there for these two. Mm -hmm. Uh, patent preparation courses yeah and then um how would you describe your experience at emory law school like would you recommend that place uh yeah yeah i mean i had a good time there um i think it's hard for anybody to believe that i could say that i had a good time in law school but i really did um you know georgia tech was a particularly difficult place to study in my opinion um you know it was not a party school you did not have too much fun um you didn't date you know the the the, the joke is if you, the joke there was if sex kills, then go to Georgia Tech and live, live forever. You know, that's a joke. I didn't date when I was at Georgia Tech. I didn't really party a whole lot. You know, um, it was just basically just studying and I'll catch a few football or basketball games. I wasn't a fraternity, but even, even in a fraternity, you got people that are very academically oriented. We study together. Um, you know, we'll have some parties every now and then, but, but, you know, it's more of a social, place for you to be able to live and eat and, you know develop some friendships and see some of the same people every day and, and study together take classes together things like that but georgia tech was was really really difficult um so when i got to emory it was uh I, I won't say it wasn't difficult um it was just a lot of reading but that's just entirely different from um getting an electrical engineering degree at georgia tech so um you know at georgia tech you you literally had to spread out everything. It's just, no, I'm just going to take this book and go read under a tree. You know, you, you, you had your notes here, you had your book here, you had your calculator here. Um, you know, sometimes even a, a computer for those of us who were fortunate enough to have laptops at that time. Um, and of course, computers back then were a real new thing. Um, you know, everybody's got a laptop now you take it for granted. But even when I was in law school, maybe only a dozen people had laptops, right? So, Mm-hmm. Uh, but you, you literally had to spread out. You had to do a lot of work on big tables around a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just enjoyed being able to pick up a case book and just do my reading and just be prepared in class to answer questions. And the other thing is that in, in law school, they give you these uh, final exams that are just basically 100% of your grade. So if you were taking towards a civil procedure, as you know, um, you just get that one grade at the end of the semester. Um, some, some schools like University of Georgia, um, you, you get one grade for the whole class for the whole year. So I think you take property one and property two, and then you get a final exam at the end of your second semester on property. And that, that covers your whole grade for the entire year. Um, and that's very, very different from Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech was always two quizzes in a final, every class. So, uh, every class you were in, you were always, you know, two quizzes in a final, but then you also have multiple homework assignments. So it was re- literally just almost like a, okay, what's up next? What's up next? What's up next? You know, you take this exam and there's another one you need to be studying for. Oh, now you got to turn in a homework. Oh, now another quiz is up. So it's just continuous, nonstop, just quizzes, homeworks, tests. 
Um, you know, so, so just getting away from that rigorous testing routine, um, at Emory, just to be able to read a book and understand the material for a whole semester and then take one final exam to me was a, was a pretty welcome change. I think it concerned a lot of people that their whole entire grade was determined by one test. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, everybody I know who prepares for a final exam just does their best for it anyway. And you wind up getting used to it, I think. So. I see. So it sounds like you yeah. enjoyed being at Emory and it was actually slightly easier than being at Georgia Tech, right? It's just a different environment. And, and I also think that when you're talking about math science, you know, you have teachers that are just writing equations on the board. And a lot of times you're, you're not really focused on absorbing the material so much as you are just, okay, well, look, I don't understand anything that's going on here. Um, he's writing all these equations down, but I better just go ahead and copy these. You know, and by the end of the class, the teacher will ask, well, does anybody have any questions? Nobody has any questions because we weren't even really thinking about the material that was being presented to us. We were just frantically trying to copy down all the equations. And then you would basically go back to your study group and you would try to figure out exactly what the teacher was trying to teach you, um, figure out how it applies to your homework and things like that. But, you know, typically in a, in a classroom setting like that, you just didn't really necessarily understand what was going on as, as it was going on. Um, but, you know, you also had a lot of foreign professors, you know, we had professors from Italy, we had professors from Taiwan, China, Sweden, Israel, um, Turkey. So every, every one of these professors has different communication techniques, but they also have different accents. Um, and that's just how the world works um, in technology. You know, even right now today when I'm writing patents, uh, a lot of the inventors I work with are not from the United States uh, originally. You know, a lot of Indian inventors, a lot of uh, Asian inventors, and they all, you know, have different accents. So you just got to get used to that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's probably one of the things that kids today uh, growing up in the U.S. could do their best to do is just to, you know, watch more YouTube videos that are maybe presented by people from other countries. Um, you know, especially when you're talking about maybe telecommunications videos, it's just, a lot of videos out there are done by Indian, Indian people, you know? So, so, uh, you know, just being able to get used to that it took a while, but, but when you go to Emory law school, all the professors speak English and it's all crisp and it's all clear. Um, and it's just a relief to be able to sit down in class and actually understand everything that's being said and talked about, you know, maybe not understand from a, uh, complexity standpoint, but certainly you understand the words coming out of their mouth. <laughs> yeah. That's a start. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. uh, how, about, how about like student loans and stuff? Like, did you get any scholarships to Emory Law School or did you have? I did, I did. I did. So I was very, very fortunate. Um, I, uh, I got a scholarship that was actually funded by that law firm that I talked about, Jones and Askew. Oh, you're That's too lucky. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they lucky. basically, they funded, a, they funded the scholarship at Emory and Emory, uh, you know, when you apply to Emory, they, they have to select people to get scholarships. Um, but, but most of their scholarships are funded by either individuals or law firms. Um, so, you know, my, my firm sponsored a scholarship, Kenyon Spalding, I think had one and Long Aldrich Norman had one. So every one of these students that goes there in a scholarship is like a Woodruff scholar or, or here's the Long Aldrich Norman scholar. Here's the Powell Goldstein Frazier Murphy scholar. And I was the Jones and Askew scholar. You know, so I basically uh, got a full tuition scholarship, which at that time was worth about somewhere in the order of 70000 something dollars. And also they agreed to uh, hire me as a first year summer associate. Um, and of course, I worked there, you know, my first summer. Um, and my second summer, I actually split with them in Pillsbury out in California, mm -hmm. um, ultimately deciding to stay with Jones and Ask here in Atlanta. Um, but but yeah, it was nice to not be in debt. And, you know, Emory is a pretty expensive school. It's a good school. I like the professors there. Had a really good time there. Um, very good people, good classmates. Um, but the, the weight of actually having to pay off your student loans can be pretty intense. Um, you know, it, it's still kind of done this way, you know, where a lot of the bigger firms um, will hire people that are only in the top 10% or 20%. Well, guess what? 90% of the people in your law school won't be in the top 10%. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's kind of like, it's a competitive situation and the bigger law firms will pay more money. Um, you'll be able to pay off your student loans a lot faster. Um, but, but it is, you really do have to look at law school in terms of a return on investment as opposed to, ah, you know, I'm just going to go to law school, spend 
you know, now these days it's about $60,000 a year. Yeah. Um, Crazy. $120,000 a year overall to get a law degree now. Mm -hmm. So you really have to ask yourself, well, how am I going to pay that back? And, and again, the law firms out there, the big ones that offer the biggest salaries and biggest bonuses will typically only take people from the top, you know, 10%, unless you actually went to maybe a top 10 law school. Yeah. Um, like a Harvard or something. But even, top yeah. Top I, even. But, but like yeah. some firms like Austin and Bird, it's rumor, it was rumored back then that even they would not take you unless you were in the top half of, of one of those schools. Yeah. You know, so, so a lot of people had a lot of pressure on them to, to do well in school so they can get the job to help pay off their loans. I was very fortunate not to be in that situation, you know, just having the scholarship. I could just go to school and just focus on school. I didn't have to worry too much about the implications of, okay, well, if I don't do well this first semester, I'm not going to get a first year clerkship. If I don't get a first year clerkship, I'm not going to get a second year clerkship. If I don't get a second year clerkship. I'm not going to get a job. So there's, there, there's, a lot of that. Um, and I think that a lot of people who did not understand that, you know, come out of a lot of private schools, whether it's Emory or Vanderbilt or any school that's not necessarily ranked in the top 10 with a lot of student debt. And they didn't necessarily get in the top, you know, 10 or 20% of the class. So they wound up taking a, a job maybe at a mid-sized firm or even a small firm, even starting their own firm. Um, and they're laden with debt. Um, and they probably weren't too happy with, with having that experience. And, and, uh, their experience in law school, you know, so it was a little bit different for me. Um, I would say that maybe about um, a good number of people in Emory were on scholarships. So it's a, it's a school that I would say that if you, if you are applying to, to private schools, I'm sorry, if you're considering not applying to private schools, I would say, you know, you should really change your mind because uh, you know, Emory, Boston University, Boston College, a lot of these schools, they, they do offer scholarships and it doesn't hurt to, apply or at least ask about what scholarship opportunities there were. Yeah, as long as they're not contingent on you placing in a certain percentile after the first year, in which case you Yeah, do. yeah, exactly. I mean, no. you still, you, you still, to keep your scholarship, you did have to maintain some kind of minimum. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I can't remember what that minimum was, <laughs> um, but you, you did have to maintain some minimal, you know, GPA or something to be able to keep your scholarship, and it gets renewed every year, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. can you tell us a little bit more about your career progression? Because it sounds like you've worked for at least four or five different places overall. Yeah, yeah. Which is really strange. You know, my dad worked for Scientific Atlanta, and he was he worked there for twenty nine years. Oh. Um, and it, it's just in our day and age, it's really really hard to have that kind of a job where you've been there forever. You know. So my first job with Joe's and Askew, they funded my scholarship. Great people. Great people. Very well skilled. Um, and of course they, the reputation was just so great that, uh, a lot of the bigger firms, when they needed to start an IP practice, they would basically come and filch uh, an attorney from that firm. Um, so they're actually like Jones and Askew attorneys all over Atlanta, um, at all the bigger firms out there, whether it's Austin Berg or Kilpatrick or King Spalding. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's really nice, you know, Smith Gambrell, um, Morris Manning Martin, you know, they all have Jones and Askew attorneys. I'm sitting here and see who these people are. And they're still there. Some of them, you know, um, but, but yeah, after the end of my first year practicing this, this boutique firm, I did join a uh, general practice law firm. That's uh, it's now called Evershed Sutherland. That's the other thing you'll, you'll start to realize is that every law firm is going to go through mergers and people retire. People will leave the firm. So law firm names tend to quit. You know, one of the biggest firms in Atlanta was Powell Goldstein, Fraser Murphy, that's not their name anymore. It's not Brian Cave, you know, so that's not even remotely similar. Um, if you work for a firm called Peachtree Stockton in North Carolina, you know, that firm's name is not there anymore. They merged with Kilpatrick Stockton. Yeah. And then Kilpatrick Stockton dropped the Stockton. They're now Kilpatrick Townsend. So if you worked at Peachtree Stockton, it's really part of Kilpatrick Townsend, but you would never know that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I worked for uh, Evershed Sutherland for about five years. Then I went in-house uh, with AT&T. Um, it was actually Bell South. So Bell South merged with at and okay. And then, uh, they, I'm sorry, they merged with a company called SBC, um, which was Southern Southwestern Bell Communications. Um, and, and then once they merged together, um, SBC also bought at t the long distance company, the wireless company, and they changed their whole name to at t for branding purposes. So, Bell South, SBC, AT&T, Singular all became one big company, had about 300,000 employees, 
Um, they had a huge IP department, maybe 60 some odd people. Um, it's headed up by Scott Frank and he's still there today. Uh, you know, just inspirational leader, terrific guy. Um, can't say enough good things about Scott Frank. Um, but, uh, but, but he led up our business side or organization. And, um, this is a little bit different because a lot of companies might have in-house attorneys, but ATT actually had a group of professionals that weren't necessarily lawyers. Some of these people had psychology degrees. Some of these people had graphic arts degrees. Some of these people had uh, information technology degrees, psychology, sociology, but it was just basically a group of people that were working to manage the intellectual property assets of the company, um, manage the IP, decide, you know, how the licensing terms should go, um, you know, which assets to license, which assets to pursue, um, which assets to, to abandon, uh, which assets to sell, um, and, and really just sort of manage that whole infrastructure and keep all the stakeholders within the company you know, relatively happy. Um, and, and, and that's a particularly different skill set than just practicing law and being an in-house attorney. Um, but, but AT&T had about 35, 40 people on the business side. And then they also had an additional 20, uh, some odd attorneys between here and New Jersey that, that were on the patent side that did, you know, either supervising patent prosecution or managing patent litigation. Uh, or just engaging in IP litigation. So it was a fairly sophisticated and big, big practice. Um, after about five years there, I left and went house to a company called Aris. Aris is not Aris anymore. It's now Comscope. Mm-hmm. So also got uh, acquired. Uh, so uh, let me switch gears real quick, which is the first year when I was at Jones and Askew, I was a patent prosecution attorney. So most of my work was just writing applications and responding to patent office actions. When I was at Sutherland and Asheville, 90% of my work, ever should settle, and 90% of my work was litigation um, and litigation support work. Um, when I went to at and uh, the work went back to sort of an asset management, you know, prosecution-oriented role. Um, now, when I went to Aris, everything kind of swapped again, and I went back to basically managing patent and uh, patent litigation where I was there mostly. I did write some patents while I was there. But for the most part, I was there to manage a lot of the cases and deal with a lot of lawsuits that the company was experiencing. After four years there, um, you know, left and went to uh, a firm called Mees- I mean to Rosie and Watson. Um, and this is very much a little bit closer to present day. Um, but it was uh, a firm that had a main office in Cleveland and a, a smaller office out in Silicon Valley. Um, and, and, and basically, everybody else was virtual. So... <laughs> I was out there for four years. Um, all I did was write patents, responded to patent office actions, and uh, worked at home for four years. Um, and I recently joined the firm I'm at right now, which is uh, only 11 attorneys. Um, it's a smaller group. I joined this firm and uh, was reunited with a partner that I worked for previously, John North, um, at Evershed Sutherland. Um, and, uh, you know, I've only been here for about five months. And I, I kind of expected to be going to the office every day, but this what I'm working at home just about every day now again. Well, did you ever feel pressure to go out and get clients? Because ultimately, if you work for law firms, aren't you supposed to get out there? And <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. It's all the time. I mean, uh, you know, they say that in the legal practice, you have minders, grinders, and finders. You know, it's just, it's, it's basically, you got either people working on the cases or you got people managing the cases, which the minders. Then you get the finders, the finders are the rainmakers, right? So you have to make yourself useful in at least one of those three categories uh, for you to be able to stay at a law firm. If you're not useful in one of those three categories, then by the time you're a fifth year or sixth year uh, attorney, or even, you know, when you're up for partnership after a couple of years, they'll just tell you to leave. You know, we don't really have room for you anymore. You haven't brought in any clients. Um, you're not good enough to supervise and manage any of the clients. And the work that you do is, not irreplaceable, you know, associates can do that. Um, but for people that um, do elevate at a law firm position, you know, you're made either partner or counsel. Um, and, and of course, there are different types of partner, partners and counsel. Like I said, you know, some bring in the, the rain and some manage it, some do both. Um, but yeah, it was just always, I always felt pressure to bring in clients because that's really how you keep yourself busy. And that's how you keep other people around you busy. Um, it's a, it's a business. A law firm is not just, oh, I'm just going to go there and practice law. You can do that. But again, that puts you in the, the, the grinder category. Yeah. 
you know, and that's not always the best category to be in. You know, when you can actually originate your work um, and you have clients, you're a lot more mobile. Um, mm -hmm. And the landscape has really changed a lot. But any any time anytime you get a call from a headhunter, they always ask you how much portable business do you have, um, and your answer to to be portable in their eyes has to be, well, I have enough to keep myself busy and three or four other people busy, and I got three or four big clients keep all of us busy. Uh, and we generate like $2 million in revenue. You know, that's what they like to hear. That's, that's the person that they consider to be ultra mobile, you know, and I, I, I've not in my career been able to achieve that level of being that sort of apex rainmaker. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I do have clients that I take care of and I've brought in smaller clients. Um, you know, when I was at Amit Rosie and Watson, um, I was more of a grinder minder partner, um, you know, because, uh, I mean, Troy and Watson already had a pre-existing relationship with AT&T. They were already doing their work. You know, when I joined them, um, the firm got more work for at and uh, But I was not an originating attorney. I was not really considered the rainmaking attorney there. But I was there to basically just keep the client happy. Um, you know, I took frequent trips down to the Atlanta office where, where, where our intellectual property is actually managed out of the Atlanta office, even though they're headquartered in Dallas right now, at and um, so it was, it was just basically me just working on these cases. Um, and I was actually very fortunate, you know, uh, I made, made partner in Marine Troy and Watson based in part because of my relationships with people at AT&T, you know, when, when I left Aris, um, they literally found out that, wow, you know, Jerry Lou can start doing AT&T work. So they gave me all this work at, at Marine Troy and Watson. And, uh, you know, that was great, you know, and, and it, it, it was sort of anticlimactic. I never really expected that I would be a partner anywhere ever again after <laughs> leaving Sutherland um, and going in house. Um, so it was terrific. The firm treated me very well. I never had an argument with anybody at the firm. Uh, it was a well oil machine. They had like a whole entire staff of paralegals, um, you know, and they had, you know, like 35 attorneys, but they were also a boutique firm. Um, so it ran very well. Um, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but, you know, different environment from back in the day, you know, everything was mobile. Um, you work from home. Um, so it was just quite different. And the patent field itself has really changed a lot, I would say, as well. Um, you think uh, the job market is flooded even for patent attorneys? Well, I, I almost feel that way sometimes, um, you know, because... Uh, when I first started practicing, I think that for for patents, you know, the bigger clients were paying out at close to twelve, fifteen thousand dollars per patent application. But that that amount has actually dropped and dropped over the years, um, and it's probably now on average about seven to nine or seven to ten thousand dollars per patent application to write. But but you, but you have to realize that writing a patent is pretty complicated. You have to understand the technology. Sometimes you have to re research the background. Um, you have to be able to put together intricate, intricate drawings. You have to describe those drawings. And, and it's, it's almost like you have to, um, if you've ever had to write a lab report, it's, it's very close to that. Except for, just think of it as a lab report that's really beefed up. Um, you know, and you, you only have a certain amount of time to do it um, based on your budget. You know, so it's become somewhat, uh, maybe I could say commoditized. You know, it, it seems like the bigger companies were, we're beginning to be more about, well, who can I get to do my patent prosecution work for the lowest price? Even one of these clients had a reverse auction. Oh, geez. That's yeah. I, yeah. You know, and, and their winning bid was about 3000 to $4,000. Oh, yeah. Terrible. So, yeah. But if you think about the dynamics of that practice, it doesn't necessarily work well at bigger law firms because when you're at a bigger firm, they pay you more every year. Mm -hmm. um, and every year when they pay you more, they expect you to know more. And then they expect, and then your billing hours, your, I'm sorry, your billable rate will go up. Yeah. So there were people I know working at these big firms, their, their billing rates were upwards of five, six hundred dollars But yet, you know, you have to do work at a fixed fee to get an application done for 6,000, 7,000, 8,000. So, so all of a sudden you have to write these applications and get them done in 30 hours, maybe 25. Um, and if you can't, then, you know, you just wind up having to eat that time. Yeah. Um, so a lot of, a lot of, of the bigger firms just can't really sustain that model. So I mentioned that, that in the late 1990s, a lot of these law firms had these patent practitioners go in there. But but literally, the patent practitioner, when they go in there, 
um, they have to build things differently and they also have to have an infrastructure. They have to have software to keep track and, and dock it, you know, patents and, and patent deadlines. So it's, it's an enormous sort of investment to, to put that infrastructure together. Um, and a lot of times, you know, you have conflicts with these bigger firms. They're not used to this transactional practice necessarily. Um, and a lot of these attorneys wind up leaving um, and they, they wind up starting their own practice or they wind up building up that big boutique again. You know, so a lot of the practitioners that I knew at Jones and Askew, they're, they're back at a boutique now. You know, a firm that started with, you know, five attorneys has, has now grown to like 40 something and, and, and picked up uh, pat attorneys left and right. A lot of them from these bigger firms. Um, so it's almost like you, you used to have these boutiques that all got picked apart. And now you've got everybody kind of coming back and doing the boutique model again. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just very interesting. Well, very- I don't know if you have been pen- paying attention to this, but like, do you see that those firms are still hiring new law graduates or do they tend to really want people like you who have like 20 plus years of experience? I I would say that the firms that are bigger, um, they would still hire, uh, you know, people coming straight out of law school. Um, For some of the boutique firms, the smaller firms, um, they tend to focus more on people that are a little bit more seasoned. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of times they're not going to necessarily even pay you more than if you were at a big firm. Um, but you do have certain advantages being at a smaller firm. You have more flexibility and more control over, you know, billing, you have less conflicts. You know, there are some really big firms out there now, like say Denton's, you know, they've got international offices everywhere. White and Case, they've got huge offices everywhere. Um, well, maybe not huge offices, but they got offices everywhere, you know? So when you're talking about a thousand attorneys, there's a lot of attorney client conflicts, you know, yeah. so, so smaller environment can actually offer you a lot, but, but for the most part, you know, it's still the, the, the same model as before, which is that a lot of bigger firms will be willing to hire attorneys that are coming straight out of law school and train them, you know, for three some odd years. And usually between about year three to five or six, uh, most of these people at the bigger firms will go in house. Um, and most of the in-house most companies in-house still, want to, still want to see that you practice at a big firm. Um, and there's a really good reason for that, which is that they tend to hire the big firms. And when they hire the big firms, they, they want people who've actually worked in that environment, understand how billing works there, understand how these firms operate so they can actually do a good job of supervising them. You know, um, I worked with a guy who came straight out of law school. Um, you know, we hired him and there's just a lot of stuff that he didn't get because he never been in a big firm environment. <clears throat> yeah. Um, you know, so, you know, I mean, eventually, I guess, you know, he, he figures it out, but, but it's just, uh, it, 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 that's just one of the reasons why um, most in-house jobs will hire either somebody with a lot of in-house experience or preferably uh, with a, with a law firm experience, a big firm experience either. So. Okay. Yeah. And so um, like, what are you encouraging your kids to go to law school or do you have any <laughs> sort of sway with your children? No, I, I, I'm like my parents. I'm very hands off about it. I'll let them just determine their own course. Um, you know, I think that it's sort of a very Asian, I'll say maybe Chinese American thing where your parents kind of encourage you to go to Harvard or Yale or Stanford. Um, and they want you to get a full 1550 on the SAT. Um, and they want you to play a, yeah, they want you to play a sport. They want you to play a musical instrument. They, they want you to be like Bobby Wu. So, yeah. I, you know, Bobby Wu, well, yeah. Bobby Wu was legendary in DeKalb County here. You know, he was all that stuff. He was a star student. And, yeah. You know, he was a legislative aide to a, a state congressman and, and everything. So it's kind of like yeah. everybody wanted to be Bobby Wu. You know, your parents didn't want you to be like Bobby Wu. You wanted to be like Bobby Wu. You know? so, <laughs> so shout out to Bobby Wu if you ever wind up seeing this video. Uh, okay. Great, great guy, great family. Uh, one of the most personal people that I know. Um, and, uh, you know, it's kind of like it's, it's good to have people that you, you kind of are able to look up to, you know, in the earlier years, it was Bruce Lee, mm-hmm. um, uh-huh. you know, just not really too many bankable, you know, Asian male actors in Hollywood. And still that's the truth today. Um, but you tend to look up to people that are around you, whether it's your parents or your peers and older peers around you. So it's good to have some mentorship, some guidance and people that you can say, wow, yeah, I want to be like that guy. Um, well, you speaking know. of Bobby, like, are you involved with GAPAPA, the Georgia Asian Pacific American Bar Association? 
Yeah, yeah. And some months I'm more involved than others. Um, you know, it just kind of depends on my workload. Uh, when I joined Gapaba back in 1999, 2000, there just were not that many Asian American attorneys in Atlanta. I mean, it's literally like, you know, like a dozen and, you know, a couple dozen. And, and you know, many of those guys weren't even Asian. <laughs> you know, they, were, they were just, you know, Caucasians that were interested in, you know, hanging around with Asian lawyers or maybe hanging in an interest in Asian business. You know, he's still got some guys like that, you know, like, like Jeff Sayer, uh, shout out to him, <laughs> uh, a knowledgeable corporate guy. And, uh, you know, he's been a member of the Kapawa Bar and board of directors for many years, but he's not Asian, you know? So, um, but, but that bar has uh, grown and expanded tremendously under, under great leadership. Um, I wish I had been involved all those years um, when, when people like Angela Shu or Bettina Yip and, you know, um, just uh, all these people were present and just kind of building up that organization. But I wasn't because I was out in Sewanee. Sewanee was about a two hour drive from Atlanta. If I, if I came down for a CLE or even some sort of a bar meeting, I literally have to take a half day vacation just to be able to come downtown. So I, I kind of was out of touch with the, uh, Georgia, uh, Georgia Asian Pacific American, the, the, the Asian uh, Pacific American Bar Association for a while, but I'm starting to get back involved now. Um, and it's good to see. Um, they have lots of meetings. They have uh, an annual banquet. Um, they even have a luncheon where they recognize all the Asian attorneys that were elevated to, to partner or counsel. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and it's good to see every year that people are advancing. Um, you know, when 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 I first joined Kapava, there was just there was only one Asian attorney who had ever made partner at a big firm. Um, and it was a guy named Al Wong, who's actually a judge now. Judge. Oh yeah, yeah, I've met Al him. Wong. Yeah. Exactly. So, but he was the first, he was the first Asian uh, American attorney in Atlanta to actually become law firm at a, I'm sorry, a partner in a big firm, Gambrell Stoltz. Um, you know, so it's kind of like, wow, you know, that's, that's the site that you set on. Um, you know, and of course, eventually more people made partner, you know, Han Choi made partner, may he rest in peace, great guy, uh, mentored me when I was at Emory Law, um, died of can- pancreatic cancer, unfortunately. Oh. Oh, uh, years ago, um, you know, but uh, he made partner, um, made managing partner, Wab Kadaba, Kilpatrick, you know, he's the managing partner now of Kilpatrick Stockton's Atlanta office. Um, you know, you, you, you had, uh, you know, these more advanced, but of course, Bobby Wu himself also made partner at King's Folly, mm-hmm. you know, and that's, that's pretty difficult to do, thing to do too, because Kilpatrick Stockton has always been sort of this traditional Southern silk stocking law firm. It's the biggest law firm in Atlanta. So for him to be able to, accomplished that it's just amazing achievement as well so i can't say enough about uh the colleagues that that i've worked with over the years and it's remarkable to see you know people being recognized and people advancing in, in leadership positions uh either in a law firm or in-house yeah. um you know so it's uh it's pretty pretty neat to see and michael Wu, he was general counsel carters you oh. know so that was a big event as well um you know so so there are just a lot of people that are trailblazers i will say okay. that you know, we've all been able to sort of follow and, and see um and i hope that the younger generation you know continues to do well continues to to rise and improve you know so yeah okay great well yeah. thanks for your time it's already been all close to an hour now so um yeah so i'll, I'll keep in touch with you on facebook and everything and yeah uh, absolutely and i hope that was be inspired want some advice from you later i'll put them in touch with you <laughs> okay Appreciate it. okay and, uh, hope, hope that's been good enough hope i wasn't too boring and talkative there but no, I really... all right. yeah i'll spice it up i'll go find some pictures of emory law school or georgia tech and downtown atlanta or something <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right that sounds great okay great. well you have a great weekend then thanks thanks a bunch and i think normally when we're doing this i would be asking you a whole bunch of questions like well, what was your experience and whatnot but oh well i think my experience was like totally diametrically opposed to yours because you were like scholarship golden boy already had a job lined up and here i am like towards the bottom of the class and didn't even have a job at graduation but hey i'm still practicing i guess so you know i guess it, that's, it hasn't that's, been that's, all bad that's excellent and you're and think about this you're you're really a no bigger of a firm than i am you know, and we all just kind of wound up just kind of doing our own thing. We're just kind of really, you know, sort of in the same spot. So I wouldn't, yeah. uh, I would say you've done pretty well. So I'm yeah. just happy that you're, I'm happy yeah. that you're well, happy that you're awesome. in my office right here. You can see my gorgeous office. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Good.